She was a Swedish composer. She was born in a harbor community called Landskronen. And very young in her life, she exhibited extraordinary musical talent, both as an organist and as a violinist and as a composer. And so when she was 16 years old, they sent her off to Stockholm to go to the Royal Conservatory, and she flourished there, and she graduated with highest honors. And then she decided that she would pursue her graduate work down in Leipzig, Germany, at the conservatory that had been founded in 1843, 10 years before she was born, by Felix Mendelssohn himself. And so she studied violin with the concertmaster of the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra, who was a Dutchman named Engelbert Rankin. And she studied composition with the music director of the Leipzig Gewandhaus, who was named Karl Reinecke, and he was Danish and German. And again, she flourished in this environment, and her teachers admired what she did, particularly her violin teacher, who would invite her over to his home on a regular basis to play chamber music with the members of his family, which included his son, whose name was Julius Renkin. And you may remember him as the man who, in 1907, discovered the piece that we just heard played. They got married. She must have been about 21 years old when this picture was taken. And their early lives together were very good. And she toured around in Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and the Netherlands as a violin soloist. And she played the organ apparently magnificently well. And she wrote a lot of music, but most of it was not published. It was played under intimate home concert circumstances at the home of themselves and with their musical circle, which included the likes of Clara Schumann and Johannes Brahms and Edvard Grieg. When she got into her 30s and their family began to expand, her health began to decline precipitously, and she contracted some kind of lung ailment, and she gradually went blind. And by the time she was 41 in 1894, she had died. This, of course, was devastating to her husband, Julius, and he was comforted by Grieg himself, who said, she was always one of my favorites. But after she died, since her music was not published and since she was not really very well known, her music fell into disuse. It just fell away from view. And for a 100 years, nobody heard it during the whole 20th century. And in recent years, it has begun to reemerge. This piece that we're about to hear, this beautiful piano trio, it was written when she was 21. It was rediscovered in 2016 by her great-grandson, who was uh, living in southern France, and he had inherited a stack of her manuscripts, and he was looking through them one day, and he discovered this piece, and he said, this is a wonderful piece. We should have it published. And so it was published for the first time five years ago in 2018, 144 years after she wrote it. And as you'll hear, it dates from this period where this picture was taken, very good period in her life. You know, her, she had just married the man of her dreams. She was moving around Europe as a violin soloist. And the first movement, I think, really reflects all of that positive energy. It is very optimistic, and you can hear her heart soaring. <laughs> movement is more outdoorsy and rather impetuous, a little mischievous sounding. It's a dance. It's a scherzo. Um, to me, it sounds a little like Swedish Dvorak. <laughs> ¶¶ 
For me, the heart and soul of this piece is the third movement, which starts with this expansive and absolutely beautiful, mournful Swedish melody. Think of it as the, the tender inner voice of Amanda herself. And the last movement returns to that positive, cheerful optimism of the first movement, and it, it's literally uplifting as you'll hear the melodies all go upwards. If you listen carefully, you will notice from time to time a shadow cast over all of that sunniness, and that is the return of that mournful Swedish melody that we heard in the previous movement. which to me sounds like a premonition of the bad things coming down the pike about 10 years later for her and her family. What's interesting about this is that on the second half of the program today, we're going to hear another piano trio in E-flat major, Schubert's Opus 100. And I'll come back and talk about it a little bit after intermission, but one of the things that is significant is that it also has a very cheerful rather dance-like last movement, and suddenly a mournful Swedish-tinged melody from an earlier movement comes back. And I have this feeling that perhaps Amanda Meyer was in a way emulating that or subliminally channeling that, or I could be wrong. <laughs> in any event, uh, enjoy this piece. I'm sure you've never heard it before, and at the end you'll want to hear it again. <laughs> 